Get ready. You're about to experience the life science effect. The most influential players in biotech, pharma, and medical device. Bringing you their insights and inspirational stories. Are you ready to boost your career? Ready to set your medical innovation in motion? You have arrived at the right place. Every week, another industry leader. More insights, more inspiration, and tips you can implement right away to make your mark on the world. Welcome to the show. Today, I'm joined by Michael Coleman, who's the president and CEO of Theratome Bio, and two for one day, we have Karen Momper, director of business development at Theratome Bio. Welcome to the show. You guys were just so excited about this uh, donor preservation application of your platform that has this potential in the future, and I'm super excited. I want to talk about it. Uh, but before we get to that, fill in the blanks of of who you are, what your background is. Uh, so that people know who you are before we start talking about this other exciting stuff. Michael, you want to start? Thanks, Steve. I'm Michael Coleman. I'm the president and CEO of Theratone Bio. As Steve mentioned, I'm a native Texan. I'm married to a veterinarian, have two boys. Uh, we have a home in Texas. Um, I'm so enthusiastic about this project. I'm taking myself away from my family to spend two or three weeks a month in Indiana. Love it up here. Um, the company's doing very well, and uh, I'm very excited about the opportunity. And specifically, Theratone Bio has applications. And I was trying to understand. I'm not. I'm not. Obviously, I'm not a scientist. But uh, applications in stem cells, but not the cells themselves. It's, it's what the cells. That's like, right. What the adult adult stem cells and what they secrete. That's right. Uh, our scientific founder, Dr. March, basically uh, identified that the cells act via factors that they secrete. In science, we call this a paracrine mechanism, essentially secreting factors to affect the cell next door. And he then said, well, gee, why do I need cells? Why can't I just bottle these factors up as a defined biopharmaceutical? And so that's the nature of our platform. So we're essentially a cell-free stem cell product. Wow. And Karen Mopper, Director of Business Development, fill in the blanks. My... uh training or I studied chemistry in college um, and worked in big pharma for a while but I actually took a break and stayed home with my kids after 10 years in big pharma and was uh, lured back to industry when I met Dr. Keith March our founder who started off as a cardiologist but then uh, quickly went into regenerative medicine and uh, the common bond between Keith and I is that I am here uh, living and breathing because I am the product of regenerative medicine. I uh, was diagnosed with leukemia when my kids were small and um, ultimately required a stem cell transplant in order to um, make it through. And so uh, that connection uh, enables me to bring a lot of passion to my job. Our whole industry, the life science industry, one of the reasons I love it is that it's, it's about saving lives. And making lives better. And here you are because of the cutting edge. And Dr. March, you guys have mentioned a couple of times, he's a medical doctor or a researcher or both? Both. Both. (laughs) At at IU, right? School um, of Medicine. uh, He started out there. He's actually at the University of Florida now, Okay, um, but still involved with the company as our um, medical director. Yeah. Keith is on our board and our chief medical officer. And the most humble guy you'd ever want to meet. Um, and uh, just real passionate about the cause as well. So um, that's why I'm here. Fantastic. And in in this whole, it's, for our listeners, we have a pretty, life science, as you know, spans a, a lot from medical device to biotech to pharma. And for people who may not know what regenerative, regenerative I always have trouble saying regenerative medicine. I don't know why. For people who may not know exactly what that is, can, can one of you just give a quick, 30 second, and then I want to talk about how it may be, how you could possibly apply it to transporting organs. Sure. But first, what is it? In a, in a nutshell, regenerative medicine is using um, essentially the body's own cells uh, in a therapeutic way to repair and rejuvenate or regenerate uh, tissues. Uh, in the context of our uh, platform, we're focused on acute injury. So our 
focus in our uh, drug development process is to limit acute damage that might occur from, say, lack of oxygen, and then to help those tissues that are damaged repair themselves quickly. So I think your first product, the, the Thera 101, has a stroke to minimize the impact of stroke potentially going into clinical trials with that? Yes, yeah. yes. So it, it broadly, we believe, can be used to treat organs at risk of acute injury from uh, lack of oxygen. So okay. lack of oxygen called ischemia, obviously in stroke, that's mm -hmm. the, the main cause of the damage. Uh, but also, as we were talking about before we got started here in the organ transplant space, when you're taking a donor organ from the donor to the recipient, that organ is deprived of oxygen. So a heart is actually having a whole heart attack. Mm -hmm. And there's a limited amount of high time then that the heart can stay outside the body. And we believe that our product can actually have a big impact there. That's pretty exciting. I mean, I picture on, you know, I used to watch ER back in the day <laughs> i just remember they'd run around with the the the, Col the cooler no the coleman cooler no i don't know if there's a no relation right but they'd run around with this cooler unfortunately no. Cooler. <laughs> yeah, no i could fund the company if there was that's right you could, you could tell tell scott jones to go home you've got it you've got it taken care of right? <laughs> so you would take they would take this uh, cooler and they're running around with the heart or the whatever it is somebody's died and donated yes. their organs um so, so we actually add our product to the preservation okay. solution okay. that the organ is stored in. Gotcha. So yeah. it's kind of in a you know in a, in a liquid there to to keep mm -hmm. it as fresh as possible. And by adding uh, our uh, Thera One Hundred and One to it, uh, it helps the heart to be preserved for longer. But also, the initial data looks like the heart performs better once it's in the recipient. Oh, well. And this is really important because 70% of donor hearts are lost in transit. 70%. Uh, and so, um, I mean, it's hard enough uh, to get people to donate their organs. Sure. But then once they've donated this precious gift and then to lose them in transit to the recipient who may actually be in the hospital waiting for it. Um, I mean, I, I know it paints a kind of dramatic picture, but it, it really is. And these people... It's, it's, you know, life or death for them. So, Well, I think, you know, it is. I, and it's, not, it's all drama, right? I mean, somebody's, somebody could die. They're on a list for a heart, let's say. Somebody else in maybe some other city uh, dies tragically and their family maybe gets some sort of solace out, out of and some comfort knowing that their heart or their whatever organ at least can save somebody else's life. I can't imagine the how what it would feel like to hear. Well, seven times out of ten, it you know it didn't make it because it because it died on the way there. Yeah, yeah. If there's someone that needs a heart in Florida and a heart becomes available that's a match in Seattle, yeah. right now there's no way to get that heart from Seattle to Florida within the time frame that the heart would still be viable. Yeah. So we've got a very simple solution that you can just add on top of the existing transport procedure basically you don't have to change anything else based on the data that we have in vitro with dr march to just add our product into the donor heart uh, in the normal transport solution as a supplement so what could be simpler than that and it looks like uh, the initial data is that we can double the transit time oh, well. so not just increase the chances of it of it surviving the trip but but that it could go longer surviving a longer <laughs> correct trip. Well, then, then you could get a heart yeah. from seattle to florida for example yeah, yeah. One corner to the other, right? Right, That's right. You increase the donor pool. Boy, that is exciting. I, you know, I realize it's early. I realize lots of things can fail along the way, but I'll be pulling for the for the data to look good on that. And Thank you for that to actually work. Absolutely, look forward to watching the news on that one. Um, okay, well, that's the exciting news. I want to get into uh, you guys a little bit because what we try to do here is. It's an ongoing conversation with the listeners to try to help connect people to each other. As you see, even just having you on the show, we've already started connecting each other to, to different people, right? And uh, I also want to inspire people and, and, and then also give them tips and tricks and how can they achieve the success that, that you guys have achieved. So how about we just start with, let's start with, we started with Michael last time. We'll start with Karen this time. So you, you talked about your, your diagnosis of leukemia and actually being treated, but your degree in chemistry and your work in big pharma started before that, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So what, 
why did you want to go into the life science field in the first place? Well, uh, I always liked science in school. Um, and as an undergrad, um, did a, an undergraduate thesis, so was uh, trapped in a lab for a couple summers. And that was enough um, to make me realize I could not work in a lab <laughs> forever. Uh. <laughs> and so I had to find some kind of career that involved science, uh, but also let my personality uh, kind of out yes. of the box. And so <laughs> for yeah. me, it was analytical chemistry. I have a chemical engineering degree. I couldn't. That's why I wasn't a chemistry major. I couldn't handle it. Well, <laughs> Seven hours in the lab was too much it for was me. It was too much but, for me as well. <laughs> anyway, um, Ma- Michael's but, laughing at us. He's like, you kidding? <laughs> the lab's where I want to be. <laughs> so yeah, Big Pharma was yeah. uh, the, uh, the, the perfect combination of That's both right still satisfying my um, passion for science, but also uh, letting me be who I am. So um, it was a 10-year career uh, yeah. before I chose to stay home, which was kind of a yeah. bold move at yeah. that time to leave yeah. it all behind. Um, but uh, I don't re- regret a minute of it. Absolutely and, not. And now that I'm at the other end of it, because there's that period of time when you're a stay-at-home mom where you worry uh, am I ever going to get out of here? How I, you know, who am I going to meet across the table? Are they going to want to hire somebody who's taken this time off? And so um, now looking back, I, I don't know what I was worried about. Well, I think, you know, you went from one job to the most important job, you know, raising children. It's the most important job I can think of. And I think at one time, maybe that would might have been a valid concern. I don't know. But these days, I think it's normal. You know, and the experience that you had and bringing bringing your new perspective back into the world of work, I think, is to me anyway. And obviously, I suppose Theratone Bio agrees. <laughs> to me, it's pretty valuable. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Thank you. We, we, need, we need everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. In all perspectives. Well, especially in the startup world, I think uh, yeah. a lot of things I learned along the way, not just professionally, but at home allow uh, me to be maybe a, a better jack of all trades, which you, <laughs> a startup company needs. Yeah. Um, because in this role, I've done everything from um, investor relations to helping with marketing to developing um, slide decks to creating the website to coming well, up with our new name, <laughs> you oh, know, and so... Um, so that, that's a new name, okay. Mm-hmm. Tim Bio. Well, obviously, you weren't just sitting at home either. You were volunteering at the parish, at the school, um, other not, not-for-profits, things like that, right? So you seem to ha- have a... You just always want to be helping people, I think. That's my guess. Mm, thank you. <laughs> You're like, nah, yeah, not really. No, 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 I, I, I do. <laughs> Great. Michael, why did you, why life sciences? I was always interested in science growing up. Um, I, I actually studied animal science as an undergraduate. So I grew up on a farm and I was interested in applying science to animal production mm. and ended up um, working on different technologies to change the body composition of, of animals from, a, from an animal production standpoint and then ended up uh, studying cell biology for my postdoc at Baylor College of Medicine and working on transgenic animal technology to try to target specific uh, growth factors to increase muscle development. And that was at the time in the early 90s when the gene therapy, uh, the first iteration of gene therapy, unfortunately not the successful, the commercially successful one, which is happening now, but uh, you know sometimes those are good learning experiences. And I had the opportunity out of my postdoc I had developed some vector technology to go into a, a startup gene therapy company that ultimately became a public company um, and worked there for a while. And that was 25 years ago. So I've spent my, my whole career now, uh, professional career that is, in the biopharma industry. I've had the opportunity to work at several um, small biotech companies, also um, for a period of time in Europe in a large pharma company and a biotech subsidiary. Uh, That was a great learning experience to see how things are done at scale, particularly larger scale clinical trials and the logistics of managing such a such an enterprise um, make lots and lots of connections is also very helpful uh, to think about. If you've got a small enterprise like Theratone Bio, Mm -hmm. how do you leverage 
those connections and resources on the outside to make things happen. I mean, we are a small group, um, and obviously to make a product, you need lots of different skill sets, and uh, it certainly helps to have a good Rolodex. Uh, and then yeah. I spent spent some time in Houston, actually 10 years before coming here, uh, at a medical device company. So I had an opportunity to run that, work with engineers, and, and their products are now approved in Europe and in clinical trials here in the U.S. So I felt like when, when I decided to come to Theratome, that was a good a good accomplishment, a good jumping off point. So you left them in good I in believe a good so. Position, I yeah, believe so. Be they were probably happy to get rid of me as well. <laughs> <Wow. as> I, <laughs> oh, I'm sure you're still in touch with them, and you can help them. Yeah, and they can yeah, help you if you yeah. need help. I, 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 I love to see them doing well, and also makes you feel good. Uh, you were talking about, you know, earlier having something be used in patients, and I think mm. one of the things early on, we had a clinical trial in a company I was working at, and I had had a small piece of that project, and and ultimately the product didn't go forward, but we had very good results. Uh, for business reasons, it didn't go forward, but we had very good results in early stage trials, and it was so heartening to see what you had worked on to actually help people yeah. and to say, like, I, I remember when we were working on this two years ago and we weren't sure if the animal data were going to translate and then to see that actually patients were getting better. Uh, that was a huge reward, M- more than publishing any paper or any yeah. patent or something yeah. to see that. Speaking of which, uh, either one of you, Karen or, or Michael, what when you think about your current product, what is what is next? So you've had the animal trials. Uh, have you done first in human yet? We, we have not. So okay. we're, we're raising funds okay. to essentially allow us to do, Karen knows I'm a huge sports fan, uh, the blocking and tackling that's necessary to get to clinical trials. So we've had a meeting with FDA. We know what we need to do in terms of our toxicology studies. Uh, we need to manufacture our product at scale. Mm. Uh, we've done the, what we call tech transfer, so we've done kind of a prototype batch uh, at scale, and that worked out very well. And we just need to make the material that we'd use for the clinical trial and do the toxicology studies, and then we're off and running. As a small company, where do you manufacture? We work with uh, contract manufacturing organizations, so okay. uh, we actually have transferred our process to them, and they basically are a job shop for Mm -hmm. manufacturing. So we rent time in their facility and their scientists uh, take our process and run our process in their facility. It's a bioprocessing, is it bioprocessing I would imagine? Yes. I heard that there's a shortage of bioprocessing capacity. Was it hard to find somebody (laughs) that had capacity? To be able to do this. Yes. You understand our pain. (laughs) We want one of those here in Indiana. We we are lobbying constantly to try because we truly believe if they build it, people will come. Not just us, but there are other From what I from what I've read, there's a huge capacity shortage and one of the challenges is not like it, it. Anybody with a few hundred million dollars can build a facility, right? <laughs> but it's the it's the talent and the and the skill sets to be able to run that facility. But they exist right? here in Indiana. They, those resources, well, uh, all but the financial resources. But um, we have the skills here in the state That's and the to schools hear. to train people. So I, I, when I said if they built it, people would come. I really I, I believe that. So it's time to build a bioprocessing facility here in. In Indianapolis, so we don't have any CMOS here with bioprocessing capacity. Not, so. not in the cell, not in the cell arena. Okay. So, okay. so there certainly is contract manufacturing uh, uh, expertise here, mm-hmm. but not related to mammalian cells. Okay. Are you able to share who who you're using, or is that that that's proprietary? Okay. Okay. Got it. Um, so yeah. it's a, it's a U.S. based uh, yeah. contract manufacturer and. Um, we have to travel, so it's not so easy to get there as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would. I would love it if we could go to Bloomington or or go to Lafayette or maybe just or even you know, sixteen across. tech. <laughs> that would be even better. Hey, yeah. Only three or four, I think yeah, they're up to. Yeah, that, would be, that would be much simpler. But you're right. There is a, there is a shortage, and um, I'll be talking to Ray Coy later today. I'll bring it up. Mm, thank Say, you. Hey Ray, let's build a let's build a bioprocessor. We can do research here, and we we uh, are. Yeah. We're, um, we're collaborating with IU, actually. A- another uh, therapeutic use for our technology is actually in the area of concussion. Mm-hmm. And we're working with researchers at, at IU to do that research, which is uh, really exciting because, as most know, there currently is no therapeutic 
for people mm-hmm. after they've suffered a concussion. And that's whether it's on the football field or my mother just a month ago slipped on the ice and is still suffering the effects from that concussion. Mm-hmm. And I um, you just have to wait for the body to heal itself. Is that the current treatment? <laughs> rest. Yeah. And, rest. and some fraction of patients will have persistent symptoms. That's called post-concussion syndrome. Mm-hmm. And the researchers, uh, actually Dr. Fletcher White, that we have a collaboration with, um, you know, they, they've identified that it seems like inflammation is a big culprit in these uh, persistent symptoms. We mm-hmm. also have a project that is funded by NIH with researchers at IU in the area of acute kidney injury. So we actually have two ongoing collaborations mm-hmm. uh, with IU. That's exciting. Yeah, it's, exciting. it's great. And it is. And, you know, the, the monies that came to sponsor that, I, I, I found this fascinating to learn. Um, there's actually a fund in Indiana where every time someone – goes for um, to renew their motorcycle license mm-hmm. and other tags. Mm-hmm. Some money, some proceeds from that go into a fund to pay for um, brain trauma research, which oh, wow. isn't that interesting? It is interesting. Um, I can see the connection, I the, guess. It, the it's a great, motorcycle. I mean, I think, you know, uh, lawmakers mm-hmm. take a lot of grief, but I think that was a, that was a good law <laughs> to yeah. enact. Yeah. And so we're the recipients of that grant to help fund this research and hopefully something will come out of it that will be meaningful for not just um, motorcycle trauma, but for uh, head trauma in general. So I think, um, and I read this on your website, so I think it's right. <laughs> you can think of the Theratome, and I don't know if, it, if it's the product is the platform or if just the, your technology in general. There's this whole idea of taking adult stem cells and the things that they secrete and using that for these various applications where it would help to regenerate tissue, uh, oxygen availability, reduce inflammation. So it, what is the the platform itself is just the idea of, of the technology of taking the secretion of adult s- stem cells. Yeah, right? what, I, what I like to say mm-hmm. in terms of the platform is think about the product that the cells produce as the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Gotcha. And we can formulate that to apply it systemically. So the product that we're developing for stroke and kidney injury and concussion, all the same product, we just administer that into the peripheral blood. So it's just administered into a vein rapidly as an injection. So it could even be administered on an ambulance or with the military uh, on the battlefield. We have a, a collaboration with them in brain trauma. Um, it's a very simple product to work with. Um, and that's just an IV injectable biopharmaceutical. Alternatively, for example, in the area of orthopedics, you might be able to put this API uh, in combination with a device mm-hmm. uh, and localize it uh, for orthopedic applications, mm-hmm. for wound healing. Uh, and then we even had people approach us about, you know, topical cosmetic applications. Oh, certainly sure. you can see that I could use some. It's supposed to grow hair. Regenerate um, hair. <laughs> <right>? Exactly. <laughs> so what's your biggest, uh, so you've got the tech transfer done. You're, if, once you can start making the material, once you're making the materials, you're, you've worked with the FDA to get clearance, I assume? Have you done the INDA or is that the next step? The IND would be the next step. So we've had a pre-IND meeting. IND. So Let's essentially the, the, the FDA <laughs> has seen our plan and they, okay. they said, we agree with this. We think you should adjust that. So we now have an, sort of an agreed roadmap to okay. get to an IND. So what's your biggest obstacle at this point? Then? Money. Money. Okay. Money to manufacture. Yeah. You sure you don't want to think about that? Karen? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, That's money, literally, money that is yeah. the barrier between yeah. us submitting to the FDA is just raising the funds okay. to do the toxicology studies and then um, pay the consultants to help us do that submission to the FDA. That's the only thing okay. holding this back. Okay. So if any of our listeners have money <laughs> that they're looking to invest, I think the, the prospects are exciting. I mean, th- these are the applications that you're talking about cha- will change people's li- save people's lives, obviously, and change people's lives. So if everybody's looking for somewhere to put some money, that's, I mean, you know who else I'm talking to later today is uh, somebody from Elevate Ventures. So maybe I'll mention. Yes, they're an investor. They, they are, yeah, we are a, um, a portfolio but, company with Elevate oh, right excellent. now. Yeah, but um, it was we're a small happy. investment. We're, we're hoping for, always hoping for more. So we're going to take a short break. Uh, when we come back, I just have a few more questions. And I want to give you the opportunity to tell me anything you wanted to tell me, but I forgot to ask you about and also how people can follow your progress. But first, we'll take a, just a little short break, and when we come back, we'll uh, wrap it up. 
As you may know, Theratone Bio is a founding member of the Indiana Center for Biomedical Innovation. ICBI provides a unique platform to help life science entrepreneurs to transform their ideas and discoveries into products that will ultimately improve health and patient care. The center has assembled an advisory council of life sciences leaders and entrepreneurs to provide guidance, mentorship, and networks to entrepreneurial faculty, postdoctoral students, grad students, and life sciences startup companies. At present, it houses 14 startup companies focusing on post-traumatic stress disorder, emphysema, stroke, heart disease, cancer, regenerative medicine, and pulmonary embolism. The center also facilitates access to funding for translational research and technology development from academic labs. The center is a joint effort sponsored by the Indiana Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute, Indiana University School of Medicine, and Indiana University School of Health. And now back to the show. We recently had a press release with IU, and we had a very interesting patent issue in acute respiratory distress syndrome, um, which is a very severe um, situation that happens in the hospital, uh, typically secondary to infection, where patients uh, actually lose the ability of the lungs to oxygenate the blood, uh, and that has a very high mortality rate, about 40%. Uh, So it's very, very serious, and actually almost magically at about the same time that our patent issued and we had the press release with IU, a competitor who's developing a cell therapy for this application came out with positive clinical data. So that suggests that, you know, our concept is right. We have a much simpler approach, so that's always good. Had they come out with negative data, that's a challenge. Welcome back to the show. Still here with uh, Michael Coleman and Kieran Momper. Karen, is there anything you wanted to tell me about, but I just didn't ask the right question? You know, I I just am really excited about the potential for our product to have an impact. Um, There's currently not anything available to treat stroke Mm -hmm. other than TPA, which is only usable in about 5% of stroke patients. Mm -hmm. And it's something that affects 6 billion people a year. It's a really well-known, famous case. Luke Perry just died of stroke, maybe, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. And could have it, been something to help him. I, exactly. Mm-hmm. Um, same with concussion. Um, mm-hmm. And as Michael Michael's talked about um, respiratory distress, uh, acute kidney in- injury isn't something you hear about a lot, but it's responsible for a lot of deaths and morbidity in the hospital. And it's really exciting to think that a product that you're involved with can maybe make a difference in those patients' lives. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, you can it, hear my passion. It is. Yeah, I absolutely can. And now we need to pair that passion with some money and some support and, you know, just general interest from the public. So how do people follow your story? How do they get a hold of you? We've got a great new website now. Cool. <laughs> you can go to theratonebio.com and find us there. We have a LinkedIn page. Okay. Um, you can certainly, we have a contact portal on our website if you're interested in information about the company. Um, I have sometimes wonderful students reach out about internship opportunities and employment opportunities with the company. We've, and we've even got a Facebook page. We're certainly page welcoming actually. that. Yes, oh, we do Facebook have a Facebook page. page. <laughs> we do. Um, How about Instagram? Do you have Instagram? I've been no, trying to figure out if I should do Instagram. No, don't pressure us in that direction. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we are located at ICBI right here in town. Um, yes. It's uh, on the Methodist Hospital campus. Go to campus. the Noyes Pavilion. Go to the fifth Noyes, floor. Noyes Pavilion. Noyes yeah. or Noyes? The Noyes. Secure, I said Noyes and the security guy said noise so i wasn't sure for that. oh so the noise pavilion go to the noise trust pavilion, security y'all. go to the <laughs> fifth <laughs> <Not me. laughs> go to the fifth floor and then i can speak from experience just come out of the elevator and look like you have no idea where you are yes. and then and somebody, somebody will, will come up to you a with very a smile person with a smile <laughs> will come up okay those are great and i'll put all that in the show notes and we'll mention it again at the end but before we before we wrap this up I usually ask if there's a book or an online resource, but I'm going to change it up a little. I'm going to ask a different question this week. In the last few years, what was your favorite concert that you went to? Let's start with Michael. In the last few years, 
Well, because it was a great weekend, it was actually last year at the at the Indy 500. My family had come up to go to the race, and my wife had the great idea that uh, we could get uh, train and blues travelers tickets for the pittance of twenty five dollars. And wow. so we were we were on carb day. I was playing hooky from work. Um, sorry, investors. I'm, I'm working <laughs> on the weekend a lot as well. We were, you were at, networking at the track. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I was enjoying music, and so we were we were at carb day. 15 feet from the stage and had a wonderful wow. time. Wow. Uh, and I would congratulate the security staff at the race. They did a great job of keeping everybody safe, and we had the best time. You're a fan of security, I, I can tell. I, I, I'm a fan of people doing a good job. Yes. And I think <laughs> that, that, that that's not an easy job when you have people that are perhaps having too much to drink, having a good time, and and the security staff kept everybody safe and had the right touch, I thought, with everyone. So that, that would impress me. Better concert or worse concert are about the same as the Rolling Stones. Uh, well, the <laughs> Rolling Stones, compare, right? I haven't seen the Rolling Stones in the last couple of years. Okay, so, all right. Uh, the, I think they're on tour. They will be in Houston, I think, in April. I'm not sure if they have a date in, Indi- in Indiana or Chicago. I don't know if we have a place big enough for them. And it, <laughs> probably have to be the track, wouldn't it? Perhaps, yes. yes. Perhaps. I think it might be the last time they're going to be on tour as a group. Oh, wow. Again, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Another farewell tour. How about you, Karen? Favorite concert in the well, last we, few years? We, we, we've kind of danced all around it, but mine is also uh, would would be at the track. Oh. I, a few years ago, um, I was able to surprise my husband on Father's Day um, with tickets to see the Stones oh, when yes. they played at, on the infield there at the um, hundredth or during the hundredth celebration of the track. And, um, you know, they're a group of old men, but they can perform. <laughs> and we had a great time there. Um, so, yeah, that was a, a lot of fun. Were, were you? How far away were you? Well, I was able to secure the tickets, but my husband had the connection at the track. And after he found out, um, he made a few phone calls. And so we were able to move up oh. um, based on his connections. And so we were close enough that if I showed you the picture um, of Mick, you, you, you'd see we were we were pretty close up there. Was, you can see him sweating, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's He's fantastic. a skinny guy. <laughs> Is he? Right. He's really Is skinny. Is he short, too? I, was, I always imagined to be short. But no, but he does um, several <laughs> wardrobe changes, which was oh, wow. kind of impressive to, to wow. see. But uh, yeah, very cool. Well, thank thanks for that personal bit. So Theratome Bio, it's theratomebio.com, which will be in the show notes, and the LinkedIn. Probably I could go to LinkedIn and just search Theratome Bio. That's or, correct. Yeah. Okay. And that's probably the best way to get a hold of you guys. Or do you want me to give you want to give your email address or anything like that? All right, just go out to the LinkedIn or go to the website mm-hmm. or the Facebook page now. Any any parting words before we sign off? We really appreciate this opportunity. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Steve. Thanks very much, Steve. You're welcome. Thanks for coming on. You have just experienced the life science effect. If you liked it, be sure and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And more importantly, tell your colleagues, tell your boss. Tell your friends, it'll make you look smart and maybe it'll even get you a raise. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, BPM Associates. Set your medical innovations in motion. BPM helps life science companies design, manage, and execute their most complex projects. What effect will you cause? Thanks to today's guest and to all of our guests. Who else should I be talking to? Send me an email at steven.vinson at bpm-associates.com. That's all for now. Thanks for listening, and go make something amazing happen.